Without further ado, let's begin today's web seminar again in partnership with Accounting Fly and hosted by Accounting Today. It's my pleasure to introduce your moderator for today, and that is Jeff Phillips, co-founder and CEO with Accounting Fly. Jeff, you have the floor. Greg, thank you, and good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, this kicks off Advanced 2014, and we are so glad that you are all here. We have a a large crowd, I must say, for a Monday morning. So I'm calling in from Pensacola, Florida, my hometown, where it is a uh, balmy 90-something degrees already this morning. So for those of you who are on, like, the West Coast or North, I, I envy you. But um, you can call me this summer. I'm sorry, this winter when it's uh, when it's snowing. We, got, we, we have some nice weather that time of the year, but it's killing us right now. Well, um, I am a co-founder and CEO of Accounting Fly. Now, many of you might know us uh, from, from College Frog. That, that was the original name of our business. We help accounting students. That was the Accounting Student Network, and, and that uh, network that enabled students to find uh, employment opportunities in the accounting business, in the accounting industry. So we're now called Accounting Fly. And the reason why we changed our name is, is we not only help students, but we also help experienced staff uh, find career opportunities as well. We want to educate the entire accounting spectrum on career options and, 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 uh, and connect accountants and accounting students with great jobs and internships. I'm so glad that you guys could all be here today. Let me tell you a little bit about our Career Fair Advance 2014. So this is a, some of you may have heard of National Meet the Firms Week. This is kind of like National Meet the Firms Week's big brother. This is a career fair for experienced CPAs and accounting staff. And the way it works is we're going to have webinars all week. Now the morning sessions are geared primarily for CPAs and, uh, and, and, and accountants just uh, who are career minded, interested in finding, you know, discovering new trends about the future of your career. The afternoon sessions are typically geared towards employers. So, for instance, this afternoon session is a, is, a, is a session I'm going to be giving called Recruit Like the Big Four. So it, we have sessions Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and it all culminates Thursday with our virtual career fair event from 1 to 5 Eastern time. And if you have not registered for the career fair as a job seeker, or someone who'd like to see what kind of career opportunities are out there, you can go to accountingfly.com slash advance and register. Or if you work at an accounting firm that is currently hiring experienced staff and looking, uh, looking to connect with great talent and qualified talent, you can go to that same link. And I believe we're actually going to chat that link out uh, to you over your, over your uh, panel there so you can, you can access that website. Be sure to click um, register as an employer. You don't want to register as a job seeker if you're looking to recruit. The cutoff for firms to build booths is Wednesday at noon Eastern. So be sure to uh, try to get that taken care of before then. So a couple of housekeeping items here. Um, this is a uh, source media. The owner of Accounting Day is pleased to offer CPE for our session today. It's imperative that you adhere to the following instructions to obtain CPE credit. To receive credit, you must be in attendance for a minimum of 50 minutes. Accounting Today is not responsible for late arrivals or connections issues. There will be required polling questions and periodically throughout the session, all of which you must answer. Please remember to click Submit after choosing your answer. If you have completed the above, please allow up to five business days from the date of today's session to receive an email from source media at uh, webinarsearch.com. This email will contain instructions on how you can download and print today's uh, sessions. Bear with me, sorry, my, my laptop just um, locked me out. There we go. So this email will contain instructions on how you can download and print your CPA certificate. Finally, please note, CPA certificates will only be sent to those attendees who stayed for at least 50 minutes and answered all required polling questions. Please email any certificate questions to sourcemedia at webinarsearch.com. Very good. You probably could tell I was reading that. All right, so let's talk about today's session. I can't wait to get started with Darren Root here. Um, let me tell you about Darren. Darren is CEO of RootWorks, which has grown into the accounting profession's premier membership-based um, education organization. Uh, RootWorks is dedicated to helping small to mid-sized firm owners transform their practices into a successful enterprise. The methods Darren teaches at RootWorks are based on his personal experiences as a firm owner and the transformation of his own practice into what he has branded 
a next generation accounting firm. It's really cool. Dedicated to continually educating the profession and advancing peer firms, Darren has authored three thought leadership um, driven books, including The Emeth Accountant, Utility for Accountants, and this year, The Intentional Accountant. Darren has published numerous bylined articles for CPA Practice Advisor magazine, and he's a nationally acclaimed speaker on the subject of building and managing a next generation accounting firm. And let me also introduce Christy while we're, uh, while we're here. Christy Shore is the, is the Chief Marketing Officer at Rootworks. She has over a decade of marketing experience within tax and accounting, has a strong background in branding, marketing, communication, even a journalist. Um, Christy was named a back-to-back -back top 25 most powerful women in accounting in 2012 and 2013, and she works closely with Darren uh, in, in all aspects of their business. Um, so let's get started here. Darren, uh, I am so excited that you're here today. We appreciate you being a part of Advance. I'll be back when we do some polling questions and then Q&A back at the end. But Darren, the floor is yours, and thanks for being here. Great, Jeff. Thank you, and welcome, everybody. And Christy, good to have you on the line as well. Thank you. Uh, so Christy and I have, have worked a lot on a concept called the Great American Accounting Opportunity. Uh, so we're going to spend the next probably 40 minutes or so talking about what that what that really means. Uh, we're probably going to give you some some interesting facts and figures and statistics and uh, and some ideas that that might help spur you along a, a path of a next generation accounting firm. Uh, our agenda today is really to is to talk a little bit about what is the Great American Accounting Opportunity from a broad perspective, talking about who some of the key stakeholders are. You know, kind of where the profession is at large right now. Uh, what are some of the challenges that firms are dealing with? Um, what some of the opportunities? What does a traditional accounting firm look like, and how's that different from a next generation accounting firm? And then what some of the key success factors are? Does that sound okay, Christy? Yeah, that sounds right on target. Good deal. All right, so let's kick off. So uh, the Great American Accounting Opportunity, uh, certainly as we see it, uh, and like I said, Christy and I spend an awful lot of time talking about this, but it's the opportunity to connect young professionals with those exiting the profession and to enable young professionals to build an entrepreneurial and creative company. These are some of the things that, that you really don't think a whole lot about as you think about an accounting firm as, as being entrepreneur, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial and creative, don't you think, Christy? Yeah, I agree completely. It's, um, the, the small firms specifically have long lived under a misnomer of not being either of these things when, when actually are. But we're kind of in a unique time in history when, you know, with uh, technology and just all the creativity that's around us, it's, it's a unique time to be looking at the profession. So let's step back a moment, Christy, and just talk a little bit about who the key stakeholders are. So I, I think we're going to start out just by identifying them in general. Uh, largely, it's, it's the universities. Uh, being one of the key stakeholders, and I live here in Bloomington, Indiana, which uh, right across the street is Indiana University, uh, and Christy lives up near the University of Michigan. So we both, uh, are, this is very near and dear to our hearts, we both spend time teaching at the universities, uh, at the university level, sort of understanding where the kids and where, where the faculty are at. Another key stakeholder to this uh, really is the large firms, uh, specifically the big four and young professionals. So we have the universities, we have the educators, we have the students, we have the big four, we have the young professionals, and then we have the small accounting firms uh, that are out in the space. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about why these, these people are, are key stakeholders and what some of their issues are. So to kick off, um, Christy, why don't you talk just briefly about what you see some of the, the um, pieces of the big universities are right now. And pardon the interruption. Uh, Christy, we are getting a few requests for you to please speak up. Thank you. Yep. Oh, okay. A absolutely. I'll, switch. I'll turn up my volume as well. So if this doesn't get better, make the request again and I will turn it up some more. Uh, so basically what I'm seeing based on research and actually being on the campuses myself, you know, before I actually started with RootWorks, I was teaching at several major universities in Michigan and some of the smaller ones as well. Um, and even though I wasn't teaching in the accounting department, um, it's very obvious if you're on campus and anywhere near the business school that the big four has a, a huge influence on university campuses. 
Um, and because they are predominantly the big four on campus, faculty traditionally has promoted the big four. It's the traditional means. It's, it's what they know. And so there is a big lack of awareness around the small firm market. Um, I also find that there's a lack of awareness around any sort of entrepreneurial pedagogy as well. So there's not a lot of focus on moving these students toward um, the entrepreneurial path, looking at small firms, looking to move up the ranks and become partners, even become a firm owner at some point. The big four is the dominant presence, and therefore it's the traditional path that the career centers are sending these students down, Darren. Yeah, I agree, Christy. At IU, um, you know, even when I was a student there, which I was, my daughter's got her undergrad in accounting and MBA there uh, as well. But you know, it's it, there, there's a huge focus on on the large firms, certainly the top ten, as being the career path of choice. And I think some of that comes from the fact that a lot of the faculty probably started their career in a large firm. Uh, found out that that was not where they wanted to stay. They wanted to go back as educators, ended up back at the universities. And so their, their paradigm or their frame of reference oftentimes is the large firms. And the large firms are, are also the primary sponsors of the, um, the placement programs and, and the universities themselves. So let's talk just a minute about the large firms. I started my career at Deloitte. Uh, you know, it was excellent. Uh, it's, it was an excellent training ground. Said my my daughter, she's at actually at Ernst and Young at the moment. Uh, you know, it's it's a very heady place for a, a young person. Uh, you know, when when these guys are recruiting on campuses and they're they're throwing events and things like that, it's it's a very heady um, opportunity for young people to to engage with. So you've got the university sort of pushing this as, as an opportunity. You have the, the big firms on campus recruiting uh, and throwing nice events. And, and, and you know, they have, they have great offices and, and, and things like that. But what, I'm, what I see, Christy, and I think it's been going on for 30-plus for years that I've been in, in the profession, uh, is, is young people get quickly disillusioned. Um, you see a lot of turnover uh, in the big firms um, because, you know, once you get into the daily grind, it's it's a whole different experience than, than what you maybe thought it was going to be when you went in. So then we, we kind of step over to the young professionals. Um, so the young professional is another key stakeholder here. So so these are the kids that were students, went through the schools, went to the big firms, and by and large, they don't know that the small firm market exists. And again, we're going to define the small firm market here in just a minute. But they they really don't, unless they grew up in a household with a with an accountant background or or a uh, their parent was uh, involved in a firm, they really don't know that that marketplace exists. Uh, and we're going again, we're going to show you some interesting statistics here in a little bit that's going to show what this opportunity really looks like. And then the last key stakeholder here is the small firms in general. Uh, there are lots of small firms in America. There, there's quite literally a firm in every city in America, I would hazard, or I would uh, guess. And you know what's interesting about a small firm, and I run a small firm in Bloomington, Indiana. Still, uh, we're a firm of 11 staff. And uh, you know what's really nice about running a small firm is I can have an immediate impact. I mean, I've been able to have an immediate impact on my clients for years. Uh, I've, you know, I have more control over my future. Again, I could live really essentially in any city in America. It's not, you know, I'm, I'm not driven by where there's an office at. Uh, you know, I can have this entrepreneurial spirit. I can be very brand savvy. And a small firm can be very financially rewarding, as, as we'll show you guys here in a bit. Anything else, Christy, to add? You work with an awful lot of small firms that I'm missing. I, I do work with an awful lot of small firms. What I wanted to add in here, though, is I also in the past, um, when I was contributing to Accounting Today, specifically Accounting Tomorrow, which is geared towards younger professionals, had a chance to talk to a lot of young professionals. And one of the big things they always mentioned was that they needed to work somewhere that was technology savvy so they could work remotely from any device um, and that had a strong brand. And those are things that they didn't see the small firms as having, but you and I know that they do. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, why don't uh, I'll pass it back to Jeff. We'll do our first polling question. Thanks, Darren. And so uh, everybody, this is going to be the first polling question. And um, what is your current age demographic? Everybody's already seeing this. So um, but in case you're not a student under age 22, B is young professional under 35 years old, C is between the ages of 36 and 55, and D is over 55, 
E is none of the above. None of the above. We give just a second for uh, for everybody to to put in their answers here. You know, Jeff, the older I get, the more I wanted to move that young professional age demographic up a little higher. <laughs> I was just thinking the same thing, Darren, because I, uh, I I just crossed over between B and C. Um, that, that's a that, yeah, is what it is. So, <laughs> so let's go ahead and close the um, in the polling results and let that. Um, Greg, it's asked me if I want to save the poll questions. What am I supposed to do? You can just X out of that. All right. Greg. Thanks. Thanks. All right. So, Darren, we're uh, we're, we're going to let this tally, and then we're actually going to get an answer here in just a second. All um, right. And uh, it, it takes just a just a handful of seconds. So I'm going to guess. If I had to guess, that it is going to be C. All right. Darren, can you see the answers? Uh, I can. Huh? So about half is in is in that middle demographic. Um, interesting. I guess that doesn't surprise me though. Good. Well, let's let's move on a little bit. So let's just take a, a look here a moment at the profession at, at large and and what it is really made up of. What I find when I'm doing speaking, Christy, across the country is most people don't really understand how the profession is made up. So I want to kind of give people an overview. You know, oftentimes we talk about the profession at large uh, as being about 138,000 what we would call practice units uh, in America. Um, not all of those are CPA firms. Um, about 45,000 of them are, are members of the AICPA. So when you look at the members of the AICPA in public practice, it's about 45,000. So the difference between the, the 138,000 and the 45,000 are oftentimes bookkeeping and tax firms. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a member of the AICPA to do tax returns or to do bookkeeping services. Uh, you know, when we take a look at all those firms, only, you know, firms with more than 50 employees we count less than 2,000 of those firms. So if we start with the 138,000 number or we start with the 45,000 number in CPA firms, only 2,000 uh, of those have more than 50 employees, which I find pretty interesting. And then 94% of all of them have fewer than 10 employees. So this starts giving you um, at least a picture of what the profession looks like at large. It's very much a boutique business. Um, so oftentimes we talk about the big four, the top 10, or the, the top 100, and yes, they employ uh, a fair amount of people, and they, they do a lot, you know, the majority of the publicly traded work. But, you know, as far as powering small business in America, uh, it's the small accounting firm that's really having a big impact on that. Does those statistics seem uh, about what you would have thought, Christy? Yeah, those seem right on target. Good. Um, well, as we move along here, um, every couple of years, the AICPA, in conjunction with the Texas CPA Society, does what they call the, the biannual MAP survey. So MAP stands for Management of an, of, an, of an Accounting Practice. And there's some statistics that come, there's an awful lot of information that's gathered by the MAP survey. But there's a couple that I've, I've focused on now for, boy, probably nearly eight years. Uh, and it is uh, a couple of pieces that it talks about the top 25% of these firms uh, that take the survey. And the way we are really defining the top 25% is not in size here, but in um, the way you use technology and the amount of partner compensation. Okay, so when we look at those two uh, pieces of data, uh, we, we marry them to get what we call the top 25%. So you could be making a lot of money as a sole proprietor and using technology really well and be in the top 25%, okay? So in that, we find that the top 25% of firm uh, partners actually work fewer hours than everybody else. Not a great deal fewer hours, but about 3% fewer hours overall. What's really interesting is that same top 25% of firms earn 72.4% more money. Um, so they're averaging, those partners are averaging nearly $450,000 a year uh, in, in partner income, uh, which, you know, is um, way more than I would have uh, originally expected. But I've been, I've been charting this for the last eight years, and the, the numbers have been consistent across the board for the last eight years. So, you know, what's interesting about that is based on um, – 
on our age demographics and the baby boomers, right now we have 75% of partner owners that are set to retire in the next eight years, according to the AICPA. Christy, I, I mean, when I look at the amount of income that is being earned by partner owners, uh, especially for the top 25%, and I look at 75% of them are set to retire in the next eight years or so. So that could be seven years, it could be 10 years, but you know, in the next roughly eight years, that's a significant opportunity for somebody, don't you think? Absolutely. Well, it's what we call the great American accounting opportunity, and it, what it translates to is that there is a inevitable explosion in career opportunities that um, are on the horizon. They, they, they really are. Um, so, you know, I, I think one of the questions is, is, what can that really mean, you know, for you? Um, well, I think what it means is there's really big opportunities that exist today. Um, you know, if you're approaching retirement, as an example, what does that mean for you? Well, if, if you're one of those eight, how do you maximize the value of your practice right now so that you get the most out of it? Or why if you, why if you were running a, the type of firm that would allow you to work the way you want to work in it and would allow you to extend that eight into something longer, but allowing you to do the things that you're really great at and the things that you really enjoy doing. So that's one of those opportunities, and technology really helps leverage that today. Or why if you're in the middle of your career, which is kind of what about half of our listeners are today, what's your opportunity? My guess is that you've always been running a practice um, sort of the way you were taught to run a practice, uh, and there's a sense of some frustrations around running that practice. You're either investing too much time, uh, not getting the financial rewards you want, or that practice is consuming you in some way um, because of whether it's technology changes or staffing, or it could be a whole list of things that, that Christy and I hear on a daily basis. But if you're in, your, in the middle of your career right now, you are running a firm, and you have the best opportunity to affect change in your firm at this point. If you're a young professional right now, you're, you're looking to move out of the big four, or you're coming out of a major institution or, or a, any college in America and you have a, a degree in accounting uh, and you choose to set for the exam, you could go find any of these top seven or these 75% of people that are looking to retire in essentially any city in America, hook up with them, let them sort of teach you the ropes, but knowing what a next generation accounting firm is and, and start a business that can be very entrepreneurial and very brand savvy, don't you think, Christy? I do. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention, if we, if we go back and talk about those getting ready to retire, I think a really important point here is that you know the tradition has been retirement means cl just closing the doors, and that yep. technology that is no longer that no longer has to be the path. I mean, these people, like you said, can choose to work in a capacity of things that they love to do, um, also, which ultimately means that they can have a presence in their firm at any level they want, but still keep the doors open. You know, Christy, we, as, as you know, I, I, through RootWorks, I spend an awful lot of time educating accounting firm owners on how to create a practice that they love working in every day, not one that they're sort of fighting with each day. Uh, and that makes a big difference as to how long you want to um, extend your career, if that, in fact, is what, what you might want to do. So let's take a look at what the challenges are, Christy, with this big American, this great American accounting opportunity. If we go back and look at our key stakeholders again, you know, one of the really large cha challenges, I think, is that each demographic group doesn't really realize that some of the other key demographic groups exist. For instance, the universities are not really plugged into the number of small firms that are that are looking for people, that are looking for um, young people to come in and work with them and, and learn what they do and help them to grow their businesses. You know, the, the big four young professionals, they don't know that the small firms exist either because they didn't really find that out when they were in college. And so they're out here. They, they may be leaving the profession. Um, they, they may be staying the job longer than they want to stay at. But these demographic groups do not really realize each other uh, exist. So your and my goal, Christy, has been to help each of these target groups find out the other exists. And that's certainly why we're, we want to work with Jeff at, at Accounting Fly is to help 
um, young people, uh, young professionals, uh, small firms sort of connect uh, and, and create the opportunity for them to, to move to the next phase of their career. So I guess, go ahead, Christy. No, I was going to say you're, you're absolutely right about that. The, the key here is to connect the, these, this broken connection that's between these three key stakeholders so they all start communicating. Absolutely. So, you know, the question we ask is, is, is why should, you know, any of our listeners care? Well, if we take a look at, at the opportunity to create an entrepreneurial company as being one of the key pieces, uh, and, and I put some very simple numbers down here, which is the way I think that small firms might, might want to think about how their um, numbers should work in their firms. Very easily, if, if you had a small firm and you targeted and said, I want to do a million dollars a year in revenue uh, this year, which is certainly not, 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 unta not unattainable. It's most firms, you know, my, my small firm in Bloomington, we do about $2 million a year in revenue. Uh, we have 11 staff of which I'm one of them, and I work virtually 5% of my time in the firm because I spend the majority of my time speaking and, and running root works. Uh, but a target uh, set of revenues of a million dollars, um, a firm should be targeting uh, a partner or partner should be targeting a 40% profit range. Uh, you know, that, again, strikes back to, Christy, that uh, top 25%, you know, we said they were making about 450. So a million-dollar firm putting 40% to the bottom line, you know, that's oftentimes a one-partner firm. Um, the, the, per, the firm owner can make roughly 400 grand a year. If I'm a student coming out of Indiana University today, or I've been at Deloitte or EY or any of the other firms for two or three years and, and maybe realize that that's not the career path for me, and I can come and, and create be a part of a firm that's, that is built like this, that looks like a tremendous opportunity to me. Am I missing anything on that, Christy? Uh, yeah, salary-wise, it certainly is a tremendous opportunity. And also adding on to that, you know, working for the small firm, the ability to be part of a brand and build that brand opposed to being a very small cog in a huge machine. Sure, having an immediate impact on small businesses in your community. You know, having the ability to have life-work balance. You know, one of the keys here is to build a business to, to support the life you want, not a life to support the business you want. And oftentimes we get that backwards. Um, but in a small firm, you really are in control of, of your destiny, uh, and you can create life-work life balance. On the other side of that, it, you know, if you, do not, if you do not practice right and well, then a firm, a small firm or a big firm can totally consume you. But creating a million-dollar firm is very attainable. So, Jeff, with that, let's go ahead and do our second polling question. You got it, Darren. Um, I am bringing that up now. Hopefully everybody's starting to see it on their screen. And let's see. And, Greg, I do not see the question for poll two. Maybe you can help me. Uh, there we go. I got it. You got it. What is your current employment status? Are you A, a student, B, work for a large accounting firm, which is 30 or over? I imagine that means 30 uh, staff. Yep. You work for a small accounting firm under 30 staff. You work in private industry. None of the above. And this is going to be interesting to see. And, 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 um, and Darren, while the answers are coming in, I mean, this is fascinating, fascinating stuff because I, I think you know, one of the questions I'm going to ask you later on is is about your experience in a small firm. Um, I, you're you're opening my eyes to some some things I, I really didn't realize. And uh, um, anyway, I'm going to get back to the answer, but I, I'm excited to, to just be hearing some of the points you're making. Looks like we can go ahead and close this. Um, okay. And while we, while we do that, and Darren, we, we've got a few seconds before we get our answers, but I mean. What's one action item we can take with regards to faculty here? You know, there, there's there's an interesting connection between fa faculty influence the students, but maybe aren't so um, aware of some of these small firm opportunities. I mean, that, that's a, that's a project, but um, but something exciting. I think faculty could really get engaged with teaching about all the opportunities available to their students. Um, yeah, I, I do want to talk about that, Jeff. Let's look at these results it. really quick. I'm I'm not really uh, surprised by the fact that almost half uh, are you know, in a small firm, um, 
that that's kind of where everybody lives, you know, today. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the, the what we can do is, is help um, universities really understand what this opportunity is. Uh, what we're calling the Great American Accounting Opportunity. You know, if I, uh, I look back to when I was a student, if I had the chance to really understand how to run a small business, how to be entrepreneurial, how, you know, brand and all those pieces really played into, uh, you know, what I wanted to do when I graduated, I think it, part of this starts with having sort of an entrepreneurial track inside the accounting programs at the major universities. Um, I think that's where we uh, we should start educating uh, and I think we'd create a lot of excitement among the, among the young people. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think I think that's a whole. We could do a webinar just on that, but that's but it's an interesting uh, um, um, thought you provoke. So, all right. <clears throat> so, um, Christy, you know, I as you know, I've well, I've pulled a number of accounting firms across the country when I've been doing keynotes and uh, sessions, and I'm, I'm always asking the uh, attendees, do you have a vision of what you want your firm to be? And Christy, what, do you, what, what guess would you have as to the number of firms um, that actually have taken the time to articulate the kind of firm that they want to have? I would say little to none. Little to none. So would that be less than 10%? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're spot on then because rarely – uh, it, it, it's always less than one or ten percent. Oftentimes, about five percent of the crowd. And sometimes I have a crowd that you know maybe fifteen hundred people. Other times it's fifty people. Uh, but pretty consistently, less than ten percent. Uh, I've never had a crowd that had more than ten percent that said, "I have a vision. I have a clearly articulated vision, and my firm, my staff know what that vision is." That makes it so challenging for any firm to really get to where they want to be. Because uh, I don't even know how you would know where it is that you want to be if you've not taken the time to clearly articulate your vision. Yeah. Um, and so what we end up with oftentimes, Christy, is uh, what we would call a traditional accounting firm today. It's a firm that really wasn't based on an original vision of the owner. It was just something that kind of happened to whoever the owner is. Uh, I suspect a lot of people online can sort of relate to that. So the way I see a traditional accounting firm today is, you know, lots of compliance and tra transaction entry work, usually long hours, sp specifically during busy season or tax season. Uh, most of the time work's performed in the office. Most of the time work is performed on a, PC, on a PC. There's still lots of paper flowing around these firms. They don't have standardized processes and procedures. They're pretty unsophisticated as it relates to their digital presence, whether that's their web, their mobile strategy, um, you know, their remote office strategy, and their brand oftentimes is pretty ineffective. I think this is, Christy, kind of the um, – really the summary of, of, of how I would have thought or how I think about most traditional accounting firms. Anything I'm, I'm missing here, or is this what you see as well? Um, that's what I see as well, and that's what I hear a lot of the young professionals I talk to say as well. Well, I, and I think they look at this and they think, huh, you know, that's not anything that I really want to sink my teeth into. Um, you know, it, it feels old. It feels dated. You know, they're looking for something fresher, uh, more tech savvy, more brand savvy, all these different things. And then when you have this traditional accounting firm operating in this very traditional way, you can see why there's a bit of disconnect as well. Because uh, the media certainly plays into this traditional accounting firm model, don't you think? It does. It's just not a culture where the young professionals want to be because that is the way it's portrayed. For the yeah. Most part. But you and I both know that there's an opportunity to be something completely different than that because, you know, we have roughly 600 firms in RootWorks, uh, and every single one of them are on a path to becoming a next-generation accounting firm, and they're working hard to do that. And so we know that traditional model does not have to stay that way. Uh, we see firms where the light bulb completely goes off for them, Christy, when they, they start thinking about a vision of how they can be different or they start thinking about brand, technology, all these pieces and parts that can come together that will actually change their lives. I agree. They see a whole new path as soon as they sit down and articulate their vision. Just starting with that first step, you see the light go on, the aha moments. 
Yeah, so let's let's just talk about what what those what those pieces are. It, it starts very clearly with a clearly defined vision of the kind of firm you want. And what I mean by that, you may say that, hey, I want a firm that only services service-based businesses. Uh, I want to work completely uh, in a digital online sort of way. Uh, I only want to maybe do business clients versus 1040 clients. I want to do this level of service for those kind of clients. So that is having a vision. It's, it's understanding the kind of firm that you want. Um, and then from there, it's developing a focused business model, not a model that's, that's, that is run by your clients, but a model that's run by your firm. Um, what typically happens in a traditional firm, a, a client comes in and says, hey, I've got all this stuff in whatever form or fashion they have it in. Here, take it and make sense out of it. You know, create a tax return, create a financial statement, whatever the case might be, as opposed to going into a business and saying, hey, I, this is the kind of business that I want. This is my clear vision, and here's how I want to serve clients. And if, if a client's not a good fit, then a client's not a good fit. Uh, you cannot go into Starbucks and order a cheeseburger. You can't go in there and order a Diet Coke because that's not what Starbucks does. That's not what they do. And you know that going into Starbucks that you can't order those things. So that is having a focused business model and then having the, the clarity of mind to say no to, to opportunities that, that don't fit your vision and your business model. You know, you also can create a business that has services that can be leveraged through recurring revenue as opposed to building a business that is totally dependent upon you as the owner, which is what most small firm owners do. You leave a big four firm, you end up in a small firm, possibly you create revenue based on your skill sets, and then you wake up one day and you say, dang, I've got all these clients that totally depend on me and I have no freedom. Well, it's because that's what you built. What we want to get firms thinking about is how to create service offerings that can be leveraged through other recurring revenues for the firm and get clients that will then support that business model, creating a, a model that, that uh, engages with collaborative digital delivery systems so you're not locked into a, a PC somewhere. Uh, it's completely paperless, available on any device from any place. Develop a compelling brand and a strong marketing strategy to get those kind of clients that you want to have. So it all starts with a vision, but there's so many opportunities today, Christy. Did I, did I arti articulate that fairly well? Um, yes, you did. I think you covered all the points. Ah, oh, good. Um, so you and I, Christy, sat in uh, a room with some other of our team members earlier this year. Uh, although we've been uh, talking about a next generation accounting firm for many years, we, we sat down and we, we came up with a, a very clear definition of what a next generation accounting firm is. And, and we say it's a business built on focused intention with unmitigated entrepreneurial spirit that enables you to have a life you want. Okay, having a vision to build the business that you can be entrepreneurial in that will create the life you want. It runs on a business model that supports an environment where you can be present. And what I mean by being present is just instead of always rushing to the next thing, being able to be present in all aspects of your personal and professional lives that will allow you have the, to have this greatest impact on family, staff, clients, and your community. A business that operates independent of you creates a better working culture for your firm, offers security through recurring revenues, fosters creative thinking, which is something that we typically don't think of in the accounting space, evokes excitement with each new stage of the evolution and inspires the next generation of professionals and is built for transition to support your legacy. And what we mean by that, you know, there, there might be a time, Christy, when, you know, I want to work from my place in Florida more. Uh, maybe I want to do that during busy season. Maybe I just want to spend my time, you know, getting new clients. Whatever that transition phase of life evolves to be, you ought to be able to, to do that in a next generation accounting firm because you're bringing other young people along to support other roles of the firm. I mean, that's absolutely right. It all goes back to building an enterprise that operates independent of you. And then that goes back to I mean, all these opportunities for these young professionals um, allowing small firms to tap into that very qualified pool, bring these folks on, and help them not only build their business but support their legacy moving forward. I totally agree. So, 
you know, again, remember those top 25% of people. Those are those are the pioneers. Those are the people that are that are figuring this stuff out. They're doing it well, and it's paying off for them. They're working less. They're making more money. So why are people not doing as well as the top 25? And I'm going to go through these top five reasons fairly quickly because uh, I want to reserve some time for some some question and answers. But the first reason is the firm owner does not have a clearly defined vision that is written and communicated to staff, clients, and prospects. Quite simply, firms have not done this, and they need to do it. Second, they don't even know who their ideal – the firm owners don't know who their ideal clients are. They, they, they take on anybody that walks through the door. You know, each firm is, is incredibly well um, positioned to serve a particular kind of client. That kind of client doesn't have to be that narrow in scope. It could be service-based businesses. But most firm owners have not even taken the time to understand what an ideal client base looks like. You know, is that somebody that pays you? Is it somebody that values your expertise? Is it somebody that gives you information on time or is willing to use the technology that you advocate? It's all those things. Reason three, firm does not have a clearly defined business model. Firm owners are not saying, here's how I do business. So client, when you want to come uh, and, and have us serve you, here's how we do that. We do it in a collaborative way where we have access to information. Everybody's paperless in real time all the time. Often, too often we let the accounting or firm clients drive what that model looks like. Firm is not designed and built a tightly integrated technology system. So a lot of firms are still using disparate pieces of software that don't talk to each other and they have multiple databases and none of it's built around their system that they've built. And then the last reason is the firm is not invested in high quality brand, web and mobile solutions and marketing plan to cultivate the ideal client base. So they're not going after the clients that they really ought to be going after. And so you can kind of see how this lack of vision drives this whole lack of everything else in, in a firm. But this great American accounting opportunity essentially says, you know, young person, middle-aged person, old person, you can change You can change this. Yes, we have a whole bunch of people that are set to retire in the next eight years. Uh, and we have young people that, are, that would love to have creative, fun, entrepreneurial jobs. That's the big opportunity. But there's really an opportunity for everybody to look at this profession a little bit differently. So with that, Jeff, I'm going to go ahead and have you do our last polling question, and then we'll get wrapping up so we can do some questions and answers. Thanks, Darren. Yeah, it's simple. Uh, do you plan to retire in the next eight years? And uh, Dan, I have to go ahead and, and I'm going to tell you no on that one, but um, <laughs> we'll see what everybody else, everybody else says. Um, you know, based on our demographic, I think we're going to we're going to probably trend a little bit more no here. Yeah, we are. Um, but the profession at large. Uh, the, particularly the partner managers, uh, you don't walk into a lot of rooms anymore where there's not a fair amount of uh, gray hairs. Mm -hmm. Well, it, 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 it's the trend, right? I mean, it, it's, it is the makeup when you said earlier 75%, I think, um, yeah. in the next eight years. So I, we're at 80%. We can go ahead and close it up, and, and I don't even think we need to wait on the results. Um, Darren, it was 65% said, uh, no, they will not be retiring in the next eight years. That's awesome because that means there's 65 percent of the people that we can go ahead and, and help them have a better firm as it is today. So right. that's pretty exciting. This all starts with with having a vision, being creative, and using technology. Those are the pieces today. I believe that that equal success in the accounting profession. Um, I wrote uh, a book uh, that we published earlier this year. Came out about May 15th, called The Intentional Accountant. But it really is a step-by-step -step approach to thinking differently about your firm and starting to think in, in the ways that I'm talking about with the next generation accounting firm. You know, anytime um, in, in the book that I, I'm going to back up a second, the book that I wrote, The E-Myth Accountant uh, with Michael Gerber, and Michael had written a traditional book called The E-Myth, uh, you know, which sold millions of copies. Uh, but in, in the E-Myth and the E-Myth accountant, we had this uh, concept of being a, a technician or an entrepreneur, as if it, you were one or the other. And in the intentional accountant, we, I really evolved to, to think more about this being a continuum, um, that you're, you're neither one, all of one or all of another. 
but here's some attributes depending on where you want to be. So large, that, that typically means that you're working for one of the large firms and you really lack control of your, your destiny. Um, but, you know, you, you certainly, there's not high dependence on you in that entity or there's a lot of administrative delegation. Then we look at what some of the characteristics of a very small firm are. And, and this one's the one I find most troubling because these are the people that typically are, are looking to um, grow or move beyond where they are because uh, the business is too burdensome for them. And we believe that there's a space in the middle called the sweet spot um, where you build a business that supports the life you want to live and, and as you can see, the characteristics uh, for that. Um, so with that, if I want to kind of wrap this up, Jeff. If there's uh, questions, people can certainly go out to rootworks.com and get more information about us to, to see what we can can do to maybe help you. But with that, Jeff, let's. Uh, did you come up with any good questions from our, our listeners? We sure did. Um, uh, we'll, 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 we'll roll through them. Darren, you, you, you mentioned a second ago this, this comment that you might not be going after the right clients. And, and that actually provoked a question for me is, is, what did you mean by that and what are the right clients that we should be focusing on for a next generation firm? Well, I, I think, Jeff, the key is, is knowing who the right client is. It, it might be different for all of us. But for me, in, in my practice, I'll use me as an example, the right client for me is a service-based business. It's somebody that has um, good cash flow. It's somebody that pays me on time. It's somebody that takes my advice. It's somebody that likes, likes technology because I want to deal with them in a collaborative sort of way. Um, that's the ideal client for me. It, it's, for me, it's not a contractor who is struggling to make ends meet this month. Uh, who doesn't um, appreciate the advice that I'm giving them, as an example. Do, do you see what I mean? It, it's different for everybody, and what it takes is an intentional design probably to think that through. Is what, is yeah, what I'm, absolutely. I'm it's, it's taking the time to understand who that right client is and then figuring out, well, how do I get those right kind of clients in my firm? So um, this is another question uh, it, it, along those same lines is, how do we find that 75% that are looking to retire in our community? I imagine you probably get this question a lot. Uh, I, I, I think they're everywhere around you. Um, I think if you just go through the phone book or, you know, hopefully some most of these people have websites now, uh, but I wouldn't guarantee that. Um, but if you just do a little research, if you said, you know, hey, I'm I'm graduating from Indiana University with uh, with my accounting degree, I'm gonna I'm gonna set for the exam, but I think I want to live in Boulder, Colorado. Do a little research on Boulder. I bet you find a whole bunch of older demographics that are looking to find young people. We hear it as the number one issue, Jeff, among small firms, looking for good young people that want to move to a location and, and start a career. It, it just seems so obvious. And when you talk about young people, you, mean, you mentioned college grads, but uh, our audience is, is more in that even mid-range, and it's, it's perfect for them, right, because they have experience. And Absolutely. They, they, they could apply that experience of, of, of being a professional, but, but you know, kind of follow this lead of, of being an entrepreneurial professional. If you're five years in at a big firm, you know, in tax or, or whatever area you're in, it's a home run for you. People are looking for you, and, and you're not going to take big cuts in pay. Small firms uh, pay well for good people, uh, especially people that are committed and want to be a part of that firm and see uh, themselves, in, you know, in a partner or owner role at some point. So if somebody moves to Boulder, Colorado, I would imagine it would not – if we think that 8 out of 10 – of these partners in these smaller firms are retiring, I would imagine it would be fairly easy to contact every firm in the city, tell them about you, and say, I'd like to interview for a position. Um, and, and I would imagine to answer the sort of follow-up on that initial question is they're everywhere, right? And, and it's up to you to take the initiative to, to find those opportunities. They are. I have uh, one of our RootWorks Academy members as an example, Jeff, up in uh, near Milwaukee in Wisconsin. And uh, it's Mike and Gene. They're, they're partners. And, you know, I was telling them about, uh, you know, my daughter's experience with EY, and uh, they were like, oh, if you could just – if she could just connect us with just a few of the people that work there that might be looking to, to come to Milwaukee, we, we are so desperate for people. They don't – small firms don't know where to start here. 
uh, you know, where did they go for this? If they don't go throw something out on LinkedIn, um, you know, they're going to uh, accounting flies. You know, it can be a great opportunity, I think, for this. I, I, I would agree. I mean, it's where they can find students and and staff. What, what's the ideal transition scenario? So let's say you, you find an opportunity with a retiring firm, they've got a book of business. Is the ideal to keep the retiring partner engaged in a, you know, as, a, uh, as a professional in the firm in sort of a buyout? Like what, just what's, what's a normal scenario here? You know, I think the biggest challenge is that um, you know, you've got a firm owner, partner that has been there for 40 years, used to doing things a certain way, chances are they're a little behind the times, okay? So that's probably the normal scenario. You've got a young person that wants to come in and is ready to, um, you know, to, to set the world on fire, uh, finding the right balance, you know, with retaining um, that senior person for a couple of years to help make the transition, uh, but also not getting frustrated with lack of change. Um, you know, because of uh, there's lots of reasons that an older person wouldn't want to change. You know, fear, uh, lack of understanding, uh, all kinds of things. So just finding that right balance. Um, you know, I think always having a vision conversation up front when you you go talk to one of these uh, uh, retiring people, just understanding what vision they have, what vision that you have, and getting a clear understanding before you hop in is probably helpful. Makes sense. I'm gonna I'm gonna roll through a couple more here. Um, Darren is is in, in transitioning to a to the new head of a firm, and we have a large range and types of business. Uh, I'm sorry, we have a large range of types of, of business slash individuals. We're so like 50/50 mm -hmm. between business and individual clients. Yeah. You mentioned limiting to one type um, earlier, but that would mean dropping many profitable existing clients. Um, it's understandable. So you know you. you you suggested possibly focusing. How do you reconcile that suggestion with with, with his situation? You know, I'm I, I'm not recommending that you go to one. I'm not recommending that you go to ten. I'm rec recommending that you be very intentional about knowing the ideal client client types or type or types for you. When I say in my firm it's service based businesses, that is probably 75 to 80 percent of small businesses in Bloomington, Indiana as an example. You know, that could be engineers, it could be architects, it could be, you know, um, law firms, medical practices, dental practices. It's a pretty broad, it's a pretty broad brush. Um, what I find in small firms, it's really hard to be uh, great at construction, um, inventory management, manufacturing, service-based businesses. It's hard to leverage that across your client base. If if you told me that, hey, I have one staff person that is outstanding in manufacturing, and I have another one that's outstanding in service-based businesses, and they can focus on those, I wouldn't argue with having those be a part of your business. The problem is, is oftentimes we just take whatever walks in the door, Jeff, and when they're not great, it doesn't matter whether they're great fit or we have core competency, we just do it. Uh, and that's where our firms get really sort of twisted up. Makes that that makes perfect sense. Um, I I had a kind of a combination of questions that came in, but plus one of my own. So I'm going to just try to try to articulate this and, and combine it, Darren. But we we saw that about half of our audience today works in what we consider a small firm. That doesn't mean that everyone is a, is a business owner or works in kind of a next generation firm. Obviously. Yeah. So that being said, you have you've pioneered this, and and it's something you speak out a lot about, but. You know, just what are a couple of the benefits to your life, right, that, that being in this kind of a small firm and, and having this kind of a career, can you just speak to a couple of the, the ways that it's, that it's uh, a couple of benefits that have affected you on, you know, personal and career level? Sure. I, 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 I come in when I want and I leave when I want. I don't work um, late during busy season. Um, I travel fairly extensively. So I've built a business that supports the life I want to live. You know, it's it's a financially rewarding, rewarding practice. Um, it's not one that consumes everything that I, uh, my every hour of my day. I have three kids. They're all grown now, but through school they, you know, played lots of sports. One, one year I went to 85 basketball games in 93 days, Jeff. Uh, I had a son playing college, a daughter cheerleading in high school, and a, another son playing middle school. Just being able to do those things, being able to, uh, 
um, not feel overwhelmed by my practice, um, not feeling like I can't get away from the office and travel and still be connected. Uh, those are the real benefits, is, is that idea of being in control. There's a phrase that Christy mentioned earlier that, that the business can, can function independent of you. And yeah. I, having grown up in a small accounting firm, my dad my dad has his own practice, is um, he, when he's not there, the business doesn't operate. And so yeah. I, I'm gathering from what you're saying that, that that's something you were able to accomplish, right? I mean, you're a critical part of it, but it can go on if you're on vacation, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're out for an extended period of time. I made myself, Jeff and my firm, over the last number of years where I'm a non-producer, so I produce no revenue. So the business can clearly go on without me. Um, you know, Howard Schultz does not have to make every latte at Starbucks. The business can go on without him. Um, there's no reason that the accounting firm can't be that way. Uh, it's all it's it's all based around the kind of services that you create. If I create services that are based on on Darren Root, Jeff, and I that only Darren can deliver, and I tell the client that I'm the only guy that can deliver them, I'm going to get exactly what I ask for, a firm that only I can do. But if I create a series of services uh, around my staff, and I make it a point to always uh, have my staff connected with clients, then I get something vastly different than something built on me. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it, it's fantastic. and It makes a lot of sense, and I imagine it takes a lot of hard work to get there, but the, the, the benefits are outstanding. Um, so, Darren, I'm, I'm going to kind of wrap things up here. Uh, we're we're okay. hitting over the top of the hour, but but you know, I just I just want to say that uh, it, it, it's clear you're you're an innovator in, in our profession uh, and, a, and a very innovative thinker, and I, I think you've, you've challenged just about everybody on the call to think a little bit differently about our career. This is exactly why we want to have this event. Um, if, if you are at, at a firm, um, you can learn more. Darren, I, I believe it was rootworks.com, yep. correct? Um, and, and learn more about being a part of the Rootworks community of firms. And, uh, and I would say also if you're, if you're a, an individual accountant, you've been challenged today too about your own career, and there's plenty to learn at, at rootworks.com as well and connect with Darren. Um, Darren, before I wrap things up, why don't you have the last word and, and, uh, and if there's any other passing parting comments, please uh, please make them now. Um, you know, I, I think maybe a really good place for somebody to start if they just wanted to get more information would be to go to Amazon and, and download the intentional account and order the intentional account or you can order it from rootworks.com. That will actually give you a lot more detail about the things that I was talking about today. But the last parting word, Jeff, for me is it, it, if you're not completely satisfied with the way things are going today in your practice uh, or for the firm that you're working for, it doesn't have to stay that way. It can be changed. I'm seeing 600 firms changed on a daily basis that we work with. It doesn't have to stay that way, but you have to choose. You know, it's that whole uh, Einstein thing. You can't keep doing things the same way and expect the results to be different, right? So if you want to have something different, it can be done, but you have to be intentional about it. Wise words, and uh, that's true in, in business and in life, I would say. So, yeah. the the um, just a couple things is we had a, we had a couple questions asking if if they would see the slides, and uh, just so everybody on the call knows, um, we'll follow up and send you a PDF of the slides that Darren has presented. You can see Darren's contact information here on this final slide. Um, you can also see contact information for me if you have any questions, would like to learn more about accounting fly. And, and finally, um, this is this is one. This is the first of seven webinars. It'll be hard pressed to uh, the, re the the remaining six, including my own, will be hard pressed to to, uh, to match this. But there's going to be six more. They they're, they're, should all be outstanding. I encourage everyone to participate, not only in the webinars but also the career fair Thursday from one to five. So with that, uh, we're going to sign off. Darren and Christy, you guys are fantastic, and we thank you. There's a couple of questions that were not answered, and we will remain on the line and, uh, and answer those uh, here in the next five minutes. And um, this is Jeff Phillips signing off and wishing everybody have a fantastic day. So bye for now.